Good afternoon. The first item of business today is consideration of business motion 8101 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for Thursday. I would ask any member who objects to press the request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8101. Formally moved. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 8101 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is portfolio questions. And we start with question number one from Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role sports clubs and leisure centres play in maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Sports clubs and leisure centres play an important role in helping people maintain a healthy lifestyle. People of all ages and abilities can benefit from participating in sport and physical activity to improve both their physical and mental health. Gordon Linders. The, I, I thank the Minister for that answer. The Barclay Review has floated the recommendation of ending rates relief for arm's length external organisations such as Edinburgh Leisure. This would potentially foot them with a bill of millions of pounds. If the Scottish Government decides to go ahead and implement that recommendation, is the Minister concerned about the potential effects on health if public leisure facilities are stripped back or made more expensive as a result? Minister. Um, I'm well aware of some of the good work that Edinburgh Leisure do carry out um, and have met with them. I, um, I can't remember when I met with them. However, I did meet with them to see firsthand some of the really interesting and innovative work they were doing to try and get the inactive active. Uh, of course, when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance made his statement on the 12th of September, he accepted the majority of the recommendations. But there are certain recommendations and points of detail which he is now uh, considering further and engaging with uh, relevant stakeholders ahead of publishing an implementation plan by the end of the year. Um, we'll continue to further engage with uh, members on that point of, of interest. Happy to meet with the member if he so wishes. But absolutely, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is still considering some of the some uh, specific points within his, uh, the recommendations from Barclay, with this being one of those uh, areas that he's given further consideration to. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Um, the Minister will be aware of the great success of the Gladiator Weightlifting Club, based in Easter House in my constituency, who won gold and bronze medals at the re recent Commonwealth Youth, Youth Championships in Australia. The Minister will also be aware that the young medal winners and their teammates had to fundraise themselves to pay for the trips because no official funding was available. Can I ask the Minister what steps are being taken to ensure that funding for sports finds its ways to grassroots sports clubs such as Gladiators and others such as Phoenix and Easter House and other socially deprived areas of the country to ensure that the Commonwealth Games legacy delivers increased sports opportunities for young people who might otherwise be unable to participate? Minister. One of the big planks of the Commonwealth Games was around appropriately planning for legacy to be felt across uh, not just the city but across the whole of the country uh, and uh, ensuring legacy reaches areas of deprivation is absolutely uh, an important concern. Via Sports Scotland clubs from across Scotland are able to access support through various different funding streams, direct club investment, awards for all and their facilities fund. As well as that, Sports Scotland are also committing uh, additional support to the seven community sports clubs which are based in the area of highest deprivation. With regards to the weightlifting, the specific uh, uh, question from Ivan McKee, um, I'm happy to meet with the member to discuss specifically the support for weightlifting clubs in his constituency. But of course, that aside, I um, absolutely uh, commend the weightlifting club based in Easter House who won uh, that gold medal in, and bronze medal at the Commonwealth Games. But look forward certainly to meeting with the member uh, to discuss uh, those wider issues. Question number two, Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what role NHS boards can play in ensuring that young people receive information at school that will reduce their risk of contracting HIV. Minister. Thank you. Relationships, sexual health and parenthood education is key for ensuring all young people across Scotland can make healthy choices regarding their sexual health. This includes knowing how to protect themselves from HIV. NHS boards work with local authorities and other partners to support the delivery of high quality, consistent and inclusive RSHP education in schools across Scotland. <laughs> NHS boards can have a role in supporting the training of teaching staff delivering RSHP education, ensuring schools are aware of NHS services for young people in their area and by directly participating in the co-delivery of teaching sessions by NHS staff. NHS boards are also currently working with local authorities to produce a national RSHP uh, resource to effect, support effective RSHP teaching. 
This new resource will cover a range of issues, including consent and healthy relationships, and the impact of digital technology, and will also be fully inclusive of LGBTI issues. Ruth McGuire. HIV Scotland were today announced as the winners of a prestigious BMA award for improving HIV healthcare. Their recent report, HIV in Education, Guaranteeing Lessons for All, highlighted that two young people every month are diagnosed as being HIV positive. Is it time to ensure stronger partnership working between health boards, local authorities and the third sector to ensure that young people receive the best information on how to lead long and healthy lives? And does the Minister agree that this is a public health issue? Minister. Thank you. I would certainly want to uh, commend HIV Scotland on uh, winning that uh, award and uh, commend the work they do in this area. I also welcome uh, HIV Scotland's report. Um, as the member highlights, HIV prevention remains absolutely a public health challenge and NHS boards will continue to work with schools and local authorities to deliver change and stage appropriate RSHP education on the risks of HIV. IV. I think there is real opportunity on the work that's currently been taken forward by boards and authorities to, to produce that new RSHP resource. Uh, and also think that, that we need to consider wider um, opportunities as well. I think there's opportunities around the administration of PrEP to properly engage with uh, people around uh, safe sex messages. So I think we should consider all those opportunities, but certainly build on the good work of HIV Scotland and the work that's currently underway across authorities and NHS boards. Tom Arthur. Presiding officer, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the first broadcast of the AIDS Don't Die of Ignorance public health advert, which, with its macabre imagery and alarming tone, cemented in the minds of a generation the idea that an HIV diagnosis meant almost certain death, and indeed this unfortunately still informs perceptions to this day. However, given that HIV has not been the death sentence that it once was since the introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy in 1996, does the Minister agree with me that ensuring young people are aware that HIV is now a manageable medical condition is essential to tackling the HIV stigma, which still sadly persists to this day? Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. I think uh, Tom Arthur articulates just exactly what our, many of our memories will be of those uh, 1980s campaigns around HIV. And while I do agree that we need to continue to raise awareness of HIV risks, prevention and treatment, we also need to be looking at tackling the stigma and discrimination that is all too associated with um, contracting HIV. Uh, again, I think there was a cross-party group in this parliament where that was the specific uh, ask around making sure that we don't lose sight of the stigma that many people who have HIV still continue to face in our country. So that's something I think across parties, I think we agree that we need to be resolute in tackling and uh, tackling that discrimination that too many people face. Question number three, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government when it will mix meet with NHS Lanarkshire. Minister Maureen Watt. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Linda Fabian. Uh, thank you. Uh, Presiding officer, there is an important issue that I feel should be raised at the next meeting with NHS Lanarkshire. Uh, is the Minister aware that Cobride Hospice opened some time ago to day patients, but despite having inpatient beds, these are not being utilised? This is uh, really frustrating for all the volunteers and local residents who worked to bring this hospice to East Kilbride and Lanarkshire. Will the Minister intervene and raise this matter to bring clarity to this situation and indeed I hope provision of hospice and inpatient beds in EK and South Lanarkshire? Minister. Uh, I have been uh, uh, made aware of this situation and I'm happy to meet the member uh, to discuss it further if she would wish. Um, I think she knows that Scot South Lanarkshire and North Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnerships are currently working together to agree how to make best use of local palliative care services and supports to meet the needs of their populations. Earlier this year, NHS Lanarkshire established a short life working group on how best to do this and I understand the group will be sharing its recommendations shortly with a view to engaging further with stakeholders in the near future and following uh, this uh, proposed way forward will be presented to North and South Lanarkshire integration joint boards uh, hopefully before the end of this year. Brian Whittle. 
Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2009-10, NHS Lanarkshire spent £13,000 on agency nurses, but by 2016-17, this had rocketed to over £1.8 million. Over the same period, the, the number of unfulfilled nursing and midwifery vacancies in Lanarkshire increased from 18 to 254. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a major contributory factor was Nicola Sturgeon's decision to slash training places for nurses when she was Health Secretary? And what will the Cabinet Secretary do to rectify, rectify this situation and ensure Lanarkshire hospitals are not chronically understaffed? Minister. Well, as the member knows, uh, NHS spend is an extremely small part of the overall health uh, budget. And uh, as the member also knows, we are currently working on NHS uh, workforce planning. But perhaps the, uh, the member, in relation to um, Linda Fabiani's question, uh, would like to join with me in congratulating uh, nurses in the field of palliative care and recognise the work of the University of Bath and the lead author of a report there who says that Scotland is leading the way with ambitious targets in palliative care and reorganisation and it's a place to come to in terms of uh, leading in palliative care. Monica Lennon. Presiding officer, can I just say for the record that I wholeheartedly agree with Linda Fabiani and I know that the, the Lyons family who lost a much loved uh, father and husband Frank Lyons, an MND campaigner, would really appreciate that, that being followed up. But I wonder if the Minister is aware that Ward 18, which is a care of the elderly ward at Hairmire Hospital in East Kilbride, has been closed to new admissions. Is the Minister able to clarify if this has resulted in a reduction in the number of available beds for elderly patients at Hair Myers and if this measure is a permanent one? Minister. Well, I'm happy to uh, investigate the uh, issue that the member raises and write to her uh, further on uh, that. I'm not aware of that particular issue about Ward 18, but as I say, happy to uh, send information to her. Question number four, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review the NHS resource allocation formula. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. The National Resource Allocation Formula is updated every year to take account of changing demographics across Scotland. The most recent major review relating to morbidity and life circumstances adjustment for the acute care programme was reflected in the NRAC shares issued for 2017-18 onwards. Liam Kerr. I thank Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Vacancies and long waiting lists are leading to NHS Grampian patients being potentially sent as far as Newcastle for surgery. Under the allocation formula, NHS Grampian receives only 89p per head compared to the national average of £1, a smaller share than a decade ago and lost £15 million in the last financial year. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that it is funding decisions made by this government which are causing delays and crisis in the North East? And when will the Scottish Government fund NHS Grampian at the level their own allocation formula requires? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to uh, Liam Kerr that NHS Grampian's resource budget for 2017-18 has increased to £898.6 million. That includes an additional £3 million of NRAC parity funding, which ensures that all boards are no further than 1% from their target share of funding. I can also uh, say that since 2015-16, NHS Grampian has received an additional funding of £47 million for the specific purpose of accelerating fundi funding parity in line with the NRAC formula. So Grampian has been one of the biggest gainers from the NRAC formula over recent years. In terms of patients being sent to Newcastle, that is clearly an arrangement that is a part of a process uh, of uh, boards helping one another. So Glasgow and Edinburgh are the first port of call for patients uh, from Grampian in order to support Grampian while they are able to uh, recruit and work their way through some of the difficulties they have. Newcastle is the third option and I'm sure Liam Kerr and no one else in this chamber would suggest that we shouldn't uh, utilise resources uh, wherever they are offered from. And it's not the first time that mutual aid has been given north and south of the border. Uh, and I think it's something to be welcomed. And I would certainly applaud Grampian's efforts in making sure they do that while they sort out their own recruitment uh, issues within the Grampian area. And that's our... Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Health Secretary needs to recognise that resource isn't meeting demand in the NHS, with health boards telling us that they're having to make over £1 billion of cuts over the next four years. 
That is having devastating consequences on the workforce and on patient care too. And just one shocking example of this is the revelation that women in Glasgow who suffer a miscarriage are having to wait up to five weeks, up to five weeks to have a surgical removal of the fetus. That is a shocking and heartbreaking revolution. What will, the, what will it take for the Cabinet Secretary to wake up and realise there is a problem in the NHS and actually give patients and the NHS staff the treatment they deserve? So, uh, Anasawa raises two very different issues. So let me take the first one first. In terms of the resources to the NHS, Anasawa will be aware that there are more resources going into the NHS than ever before. And of course, uh, under the uh, Labour proposals in the manifesto for the 2016 election, there would have been less money going into the NHS than it's been delivered. However, he does make a point that I would agree with, and that is that uh, demand for the NHS continues to grow and uh, puts pressure on services, which is why we need to reform and change the way services are organised, which is why we're working through the integrated partnerships to ensure that more people are kept out of hospital and avoid admission to hospital in the first place, which is very important given the growing frail elderly population. He also raises the very uh, serious case uh, within Glasgow and Clyde uh, that uh, has uh, been raised over recent days. And what I can say uh, is this, that there is a, a full investigation going on. I understand that there has been a complaint raised about this case. Uh, I have asked the Chief Medical Officer to look into this um, in Glasgow and the rest of Scotland. The initial indications are from Glasgow and Clyde that this is an isolated case, totally unacceptable, uh, and I am absolutely determined that that standard of health care uh, is not uh, something that we would, we would absolutely not accept that standard of health care for anybody anywhere in Scotland, but it is not reflective of the rest of the service within Glasgow and Clyde. But the Chief Medical Officer is seeking uh, assurance about that, but not just in Glasgow and Clyde, but elsewhere, because I want to make sure that women are across Scotland get the highest uh, level of care, particular in very, very sensitive circumstances like this. Question number five, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> Does the Minister not see that with 3,500 fewer planned operations, the second worst waiting times record, uh, hundreds Mr. of cancelled... Rumbles, so you have to read the first question first. I think you're on your supplementary. Okay. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the number of planned operations that have been cancelled on the NHS Grampian. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, decisions to cancel a patient's operation is never taken lightly. Uh, all boards, including Grampian, work very hard to keep cancellations to a minimum, and we continue to work with them to see sustained improvements. It's important to remember that this is a small percentage of the overall number of planned operations taking place. The latest cancelled operations figures for the month of August show that in Grampian, 1,947 operations were carried out, with 83 operations cancelled due to capacity or non-clinical reasons. Cabinet Secretary, 3,471 fewer planned operations. The second worst waiting times record of any NHS board, hundreds of cancelled operations for non-clinical reasons, and most recently, specialist veteran services pulling down the shutters through lack of funding support from NHS Grampian. And I'm not the only Grampian MSP who's raising this issue. Doesn't she believe that now is the time to fund NHS Grampian properly? Because it's only got 89% of the average per head of population. It's not the amount of money specifically that the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned. It's the share of the budget that needs to be addressed. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I answered to Liam Kerr uh, earlier on, the, the issue of NRAC uh, funding has uh, been an important uh, element of the funding that Grampian has received in recognition of the challenges that they have. And that is why since 2015-16, they've received additional funding of £47 million for the specific purpose of accelerating funding parity in line with the NRAC formula. Uh, as I said in my initial answer, um, there are a very small number of operations cancelled due to capacity or non-clinical reasons. Uh, 
for, the, for August, that amounts to 2.8% of operations cancelled due to capacity and non-clinical reasons. Obviously, a number of other operations are cancelled for clinical reasons because patients are not uh, fit to have the procedure or by patients themselves. Uh, but for those cancelled due to capacity and non-clinical reasons, it's 2.8%. The vast majority of operations go ahead. Mike Wilms also mentioned the veteran services, and this has been important. And we have supported boards to continue uh, to provide uh, veteran services in a very, very difficult backdrop because obviously these services were previously funded through the LIBOR monies, as Mike Rumbles will be available, uh, will be aware, and that money was then withdrawn. So we have tried to help boards to sustain these services, and we have offered boards a partnership arrangement uh, for funding. But it would be up to those boards to either accept or not accept. Most have, but there are a small number of boards who have not decided to go down that route, and that is a local decision for those boards. Gillian Martin. Sir, can I ask Cabinet Secretary what measures have been taken by NHS Grampian in conjunction with local universities and colleges to train more theatre staff for Aberdeen Royal Infirmary to address staffing issues? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member uh, touches on a, a very important point because one of the, the key issues here for Grampian is the ability to re recruit and retain uh, staff. And one of the key issues there is theatre staff for the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. So the board are taking a number of, of important measures to plan and sustain its theatre workforce. For example, it's one of a number of boards who have piloted a new approach to developing uh, the theatre workforce. They're working in partnership with the northeast of Scotland colleges to develop and deliver a professional development award in perioperative practice, which has enabled the existing theatre staff to further develop their skills and experience, ensuring a, a clearer career pathway and helping to attract and retain theatre staff. So a lot of work going on. They have restructured entirely the way they organise their theatres in Grampian. And I'm confident that uh, over time, they will be able to build up their capacity again and be able to sustain and provide um, uh, quicker uh, access to procedures than they currently are. And Tom Mason. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, we've heard from the minister a lot of information about how much extra resources are going in and the, the partnership arrangements with Newcastle and Glasgow and Edinburgh. What we haven't heard from the same thing is how long is this going to go on for, because it's been going on for several years so far, and how can, can you give to the northeast of Scotland a promise as to when the things will normalise itself and there will not be cancellations and the waiting list will come down to what can be considered at a normal level. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the arrangements for cardiac patients uh, are, are, are a new arrangement that hasn't been going on for years. They've had to come to these arrangements because of the particular issues of not being able to recruit to those specialties within Grampian. And it's important to make sure that cardiac patients within uh, the, the north of Scotland, Gramp the Grampian area, get access to the cardiac uh, uh, specialists that they need to get access to. So that's why they've come up with the uh, very important arrangements with Glasgow and Edinburgh and uh, Newcastle, although they've not had to utilise any capacity in Newcastle so far, because uh, the most important people in all of this are the cardiac patients. And uh, I know that they would want to get the treatment uh, as quickly as possible. And if that means travelling from a, out with Grampian, then I'm sure uh, that is what they're prepared to do. Meanwhile, Grampian are working very, very hard to try and recruit those specialists to Grampian so they can get their own service back up and running to be able to meet, the, to meet their own demands uh, from the Grampian area. Question number six has not been lodged. Question number seven, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase access to new medicines. Cabinet Secretary. In uh, December 2016, Dr Brian Montgomery published his independent review on access to new medicines, which recognised that the Scottish Government has made significant reforms and investment to improve access to newly licensed medicines in recent years. The review found that following our previous reforms, the Scottish Medicines Consortium acceptance rates had markedly increased. We are committed to continuing to build on these improvements and are taking forward the recommendations set out in Dr Montgomery's report. We are working in collaboration with stakeholders, including the SMC, NHS Scotland and the pharmaceutical industry to implement the recommendations as quickly as possible. We would also encourage drug manufacturers to make reforms too, so that they bring forward medicines at a fair price. 
Sandra White. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for replying, certainly about the pharmaceuticals and the fair price. But I just uh, want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, and I know she will be aware as members and probably the public as well, that to cross country working is very important when you're looking to access new medicines. So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what impact leaving the single market will have on accessing new treatments and medicines? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, this is a, an important issue. Should the, the UK choose to, to take us out of the single market and withdraw our membership of the European Medicines Agency, then there's a clear risk that pharmaceutical companies could be less committed to the UK market than they will be to the, uh, rest, the larger attractions of the EU and the US, meaning that patients in Scotland and the wider UK could face delays in accessing the medicines they need in comparison to the time skills that we currently enjoy as a full member of the EU. I'm also concerned that medicine manufacturers could be negatively impacted by additional costs as a result of having to work separately with the UK. And this may mean that some manufacturers choose not to do so at all as a result or could increase the cost of our medicines. So in the light of all of this, I wrote to the Secretary of State for Health, uh, Jeremy Hunt, in July, seeking clarity on the UK's future relationship with the European Medicines Agency and have requested the full and regular involvement of the Scottish Government in these crucial discussions and decisions. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an update to constituents of mine and those across the uh, Parliament here um, what steps the Scottish Government is taking to allow uh, cystic fibrosis patients who are campaigning for access to the drug or can be? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can say to uh, Miles Briggs that obviously he will be aware that decisions made by the SMC have and continue to be independent of ministers in Parliament and are based on clinical and cost-effectiveness uh, uh, at a, po a national population level for all of Scotland. I wrote to Vertex Pharmaceuticals in March to encourage them to take forward discussions about the cost of our CAMBI with colleagues in the National uh, Health Services uh, Scotland Division who are best placed to advise them on pricing approaches and a fair price that could support the securing of a positive recommendation from the Scottish Medicines Consortium for the prescribing of these products in the NHS in Scotland. These talks are underway uh, and I'm sure the member will appreciate that we should allow those talks to continue. Uh, um, and uh, through those discussions, I, I would certainly hope that the manufacturer will make their best offer on price and indicate that they will uh, resub resubmit an application for our candidate to the SMC uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. Polly McNeill. Will the Scottish Government consider funding Sativex, a cannabis-based medicine, as NHL's Wales have done? Um, drugs such as Sativex can help treat MS, arthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions. Tony Wiggins, who is chairman of the Cardiff and Vale MS Society, has trailed Sativex and called it a tremendous step forward. Um, he said it's good for spasms, uh, for other effects of AMS, and it does work. I realise that it is not authorised by the Scottish Medicines Consortium, but however, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that doctors are able to prescribe it should they wish to, but I wonder if she would consider um, going down the same road. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as Polly McNeill has is, uh, said, you know, whether the SMC decision is not to accept a medicine for routine use, then clinicians are still able to request access to medicines for their patients on an individual case-by-case -case, uh, basis where they feel it would be of significant uh, clinical benefit to do so. Um, that's currently done through the individual patient treatment requests. Uh, that's being changed uh, to the new uh, peer-approved clinical system, which is going to improve consistency and uh, ensure that patients get access to the right treatment at the right time. And there's obviously going to be a national appeal panel to help ensure that there is, there is uh, more uh, uh, equity of, of access. So that would be the suggestion uh, to the, um, the patient that Polly McNeill is talking about. And obviously they, they could make a further submission to SMC. I'm not sure in the specific case whether they're planning to, but I could certainly write to Polly McNeill uh, with that information. Question number eight, Tavish Scott. Thank you, officer, uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much of the £1.3 million that NHS Shetland is to pay in locum costs in 2017-18 will be used to cover GP vacancies. Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, uh, the, that information is not held centrally. However, my officials have contacted the board and I understand that over a million pounds is available to cover GP vacancies and single-handed GP leave cover in NHS Shetland. Thank you. Uh, the island of Yale used to have two GPs running an independent practice. To save money, uh, locum cover is now to be replaced by an advanced nurse practitioner. Uh, would, she, would the Minister accept that this puts a clinical burden uh, on an individual who will have to refer cases to a GP by phone in Lerwick? Is this acceptable or would it not be better to have a GP in the island of Yale? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm aware that there have been challenges and difficulties in trying to recruit uh, to a number of GP posts uh, within uh, the, the area. Uh, there's a lot of work that has gone on to try and incentivise some of those posts. I'm sure the member will be aware uh, of those. Uh, there's also, um, as I understand, a, a very successful uh, GP training scheme through the Lerwick practice with uh, four GP registrars currently in training that are due to qualify in about 18 months' time and they want to stay in Shetland. Now, where about they end up uh, being located, again, is, is something uh, for discussion. But uh, the, the role of advanced nurse practitioners is important here and I know that that is being uh, looked at as a way of supporting uh, the, the GP uh, recruitment issues and of course they are very very experienced nurses in their own right. In terms of the clinical backup that they have that is important and they, sh they should have access to uh, that GP support. Uh, something I'm certainly happy to discuss further with Tavish Scott if we can help through the Rural uh, Medicine Collaborative and other incentives I would hope the NHS Shetland would be taking advantage of all of those. Question number nine, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it's had with NHS Dumfries and Galloway regarding the equity and equality of service across its area. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has regular contact and discussion with NHS uh, Dumfries and Galloway and was in contact last week as part of the Board's annual review. At this meeting, a range of topics were covered and this included performance, finance and the new £200 million Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary and the positive ongoing engagement with the Integration Joint Board. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. You'll be aware that the cross-party uh, petition, which was received widespread support in Sunrara Wigginshire, seeking a long-term commitment from the Scottish Government for the retention and improvement of the services at the Galloway Community Hospital. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for accepting my invitation to come to Sunrar to collect the cross-party petition on the Galloway Community Hospital and to hear the real, the real concerns of local people. With the never-increasing pressure on hospital bed numbers, does this Cabinet Secretary agree with me that cottage hospitals play a vital role in transitioning patients from hospital to their homes? And she, can she also confirm that there are no plans to close any, cost, ho, to close any cottage hospitals in Galloway and West Dumfries? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am uh, fully aware of the strength of local feeling uh, in support of Galloway uh, Community Hospital um, from um, not just uh, Finlay Carson, but from all, all local members, in fact. Uh, the temporary changes over the summer were taken to ensure patient safety um, services at Galloway Community Hospital are now running as normal, something I hope the member will uh, welcome. Um, the board um, works hard to overcome some of the recruitment and retention issues around the hospital. It's a hospital that is very valued. It uh, actually provides a, a very high quality level of healthcare services and actually provides services well beyond those uh, found in other uh, community hospitals. So the NHS Dumfries and Galloway have given assurances that they will continue to keep local communities fully informed uh, about uh, any changes to services at the hospital where these are unavoidable for patient safety reasons and they're keen to engage with local people and indeed their representatives and they held a public meeting in July to discuss these issues which I understand was productive. Emma Harper. Thank you. Remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse. It's to ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she agree with me that health boards have a duty to undertake any service redesign in close consultation with stakeholders, including patients and parliamentarians? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, yes, and Emma Harper has raised these issues um, on a number of occasions, and of course boards do have a, a duty to carry out full and meaningful engagement with all stakeholders when considering taking forward any service change proposals in line with well-established Scottish Government guidance. But I think it's also important that they uh, engage not just around any service change proposals, but they engage anyway. And I think one of the issues emerging from the public meeting in July with the, the board around Galloway uh, Community Hospital was the need for, for full information so that I think people appreciate that sometimes uh, there's unavoidable challenges that arise due to staff um, uh, sickness or, or other issues that require the board to ensure that sa uh, services are continued to be, be provided in a safe way. But I think they need to make sure that that information is full and uh, that they make sure the community is fully aware of any changes. And I think they've learned a lesson from the experience uh, at the, the Galloway Community Hospital. Colin Smith. Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the biggest challenge in delivering equity and equality of service in the rural area, such as Dumfries and Galloway, is the current NHS recruitment crisis? In the region, there are 150 nursing and midwifery vacancies, 28 allied health professional vacancies, 28 consultant vacancies, that's 22% of all posts, and 42% of GP practices have an infilled GP post. The recent Audit Scotland report on workforce planning revealed that two-thirds of interviews in the region for consulting posts are cancelled because of a lack of suitable applicants. When is the Scottish Government going to take responsibility for letting down patients in Dumfries and Galloway and apologise for 10 years yeah. of abject failure yeah. in proper NHS workforce planning? Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the, uh, Dumfries and Galloway, as uh, other health boards, have more staff than they have ever had, and they have more posts than they have ever had. But there are, there are vacancy issues within uh, certain areas of the country, particularly in more remote and rural areas. And, and that is about us trying to attract uh, staff to come to Scotland and to make sure we are training enough staff. That's why we have increased over the last five years the number of nursing and midwifery training posts. That's why we are expanding the undergraduate medical uh, uh, courses. That's why we're adding a new graduate medical school. And that's why we published a workforce plan uh, back in the summer in order to work with boards to ensure that we do have the staff uh, going forward. But, you know, we are not the only part of the, the country to uh, have issues with uh, recruitment and retention. It is an issue for all of the UK health systems and indeed beyond. Some of these specialties are in, actually very, very difficult to recruit to and Dumfries and Galloway are no different from that. But we will continue to support them in making sure that they can uh, uh, successfully recruit and retain the, the staff. The GP issue, as members will be aware, is something we are working very, very hard on with the new contract, which I think will help uh, make a real difference in attracting GPs to come and work here in Scotland and actually to make general practice an attractive career for the young doctors. Question 10 has not been lodged. Question 11, Emma Harper. Once again, remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Law Society of Scotland's warning that ending freedom of movement may deter medical professionals from moving here and have implications for people already living and working here. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scotland's health workforce benefits enormously from the contribution made by staff from across the European Union. Uh, we need to retain the ability to recruit freely from this diverse and experienced talent pool. And I agree with the Law Society that any restrictions on current free movement arrangements will inevitably pose recruitment and retention challenges for health boards. I have met with a number of EU staff directly who tell me of colleagues who have already left Scotland. Staff are understandably anxious and uncertain about the impact of Brexit on their right to live and work in Scotland and we urgently need clarity from the UK Government on future immigration policy. The Scottish Government has signalled its desire to retain freedom of movement and access to the single market and will continue to do so uh, in all we can to protect Scotland's interests in Europe. Emma Harper. Thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we do need urgent clarity on what the rights of the EU nationals working in the NHS will be after we are taken out of the EU? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> yes, we do. Um, a number of members 
this afternoon have raised issues about recruitment and retention and of course it's important that we as a Scottish Government do everything we can to grow the workforce here in Scotland and we are doing that by expanding training places in nursing, uh, with, uh, within medicine and elsewhere. However, to, to uh, stop the flow of EU uh, nationals here to Scotland who provide an extremely important part of the workforce uh, in the, the here and now and into the future is a, a very, very retrograde step indeed and will make the situation uh, here in Scotland much, much worse. So I want to send a message out to EU citizens living here that they are very welcome. We want them to stay and indeed we want future generations of EU citizens to come and work here in our health and care services. Thank you very much. Thank all members. That concludes